Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. I am very privileged and blessed to be able to talk to many great historians and people that preserve the history of sports. And sometimes you come along these people that have such great passion and knowledge, it just blows you away and you can sit there and listen all day. But recently I got to talk to Larry Lester, uh, author of nine different books on the Negro Leagues of Baseball. And he talked about his re- most recent book that he did with Wayne Stivers called The Negro Leagues Book, Volume 2. And our conversation, well, I'm sure enlightened you as it did me so I learn more on my quest to find out more about sports history. Hi, my name's Darren Hayes and I know you've heard me on the Pigskin Dispatch talking about football history for years. Well, now I'm on a new mission, a quest to find sports history in other sports as well as football by learning through the jerseys and the apparel and the gear that the players wore and the franchises supplied their teams. It's an educational trip and I'm taking you with me day by day, player by player, uniform by uniform. The Sports Jersey Dispatch. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of the Sports Jersey Dispatch. During an unfair and ugly time in American history, baseball, there was once segregated. Men of color were not welcome to play in the mainstream major leagues of baseball. That is up until about 1947, when Jackie Robinson historically became a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers, famously breaking the color barrier in major leagues base of baseball. And basically, it opened up the door for athletes in all professional sports arenas uh, to have an opportunity to play uh, over the years in their respective sports in the mainstream organized white leagues. Robinson, Satchel Page, Larry Doby, Sam Jethro, as well as many other ball players of color in most of the first half of the 20th century played baseball professionally in what has gone down in the annals of history known as the Negro Leagues of Baseball. In my quest to learn about the great stories of past athletes, I ask for the help of historians and passionate experts who educate us in the effort to learn about the past and preserve the history of sports. So we are so fortunate to have a man on today that has literally wrote the book on the history of black baseball. In fact, nine books to his credit on the subject, plus a very informative website. May I introduce to you, Larry Lester. Welcome to the Pigpen. Thank you, Darwin, for having me on your Pigpen show. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this is is, uh, quite an honor, sir, because uh, as I was telling you before we got started here, uh, a few friends of mine had, had sent me to some references. I was looking for jersey numbers on on mem- members and players of the Negro Leagues, and I, I couldn't find very many at all. W- one of the gentlemen that referenced me to your book, I, I, he said this is probably the only place you can find them. So I, I purchased a copy on Amazon and it said it was a paperback. I was expecting, you know, Reader's Digest to come uh, in the Amazon package. And what I got was uh, probably the New York City Yellow Pages, because this is just a gigantic book filled with information and quite a credit, sir, to to you and your co-author, Wayne Stivers. Uh, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background and your passion of uh, wanting to write such a book as this. Well, my my interest in baseball started as a kid. But first of all, I'd like to say I'm a member of Sabre, been a member for the last 30 years, along with Wayne Stivers, my co-author, uh, who is uh, dealing with some health challenges right now in Chicago. Uh, that's where I met him. Uh, but I, I grew up on 27th in Brooklyn, about five blocks from Municipal Stadium, the home of the Kansas City Athletics. Uh, during the 50s and 60s, uh, I went to a lot of ball games. I could walk to the ball game, pay a dollar and fifty cents, and sit anywhere I wanted because 
the A's were not a very good team, so the ballpark was never crowded. And so growing up in an all-Black neighborhood, going to an all-Black school, all-Black church, I would go to the game and I would see a lot of white people and very few Black ball players. And so that kind of jump-started my interest. And as I went back to my neighborhoods and family and I would talk to the seniors and I would ask them, where are the Negro League players at? Where are the black players at? And they would tell me they played in the Negro Leagues. The what leagues? I never heard of anything like that. So hmm. they would tell me about Satchel Paige, Coopapa Bell, Josh Gibson, Bullet Rogan, Hilton Smith, and many, many great ball players. And that jump started my interest in trying to find out more about black baseball and its history. So we fast forward to 1970. I'm getting out of college, graduating from college about that time. And Robert Peterson comes out with this book called Only the Ball is White. And I'm like, wow, all these stories that I thought were mythical are true. And that really motivated me. And, and that I wanted to find out more and more. Curiosity became my philosophy about who are these guys? Where, where are they at? And I started getting addresses and telephone numbers of these men and going to their homes and interviewing them and uh, listening to their stories. And it made me very proud to be a black man where we have some black youth today who grew up without a father. I probably had 80 or 90 black men leading the way for me, giving me advice on how to conduct myself and, uh, and for that, I'm, I'm forever grateful for. So I, I had probably 80 daddies who, who helped me along the way. Well, that's tremendous. Uh, you know, that's very fortunate to have that many uh, advisors and mentors to, to help you guide your way through, through life. Uh, there's not many people that can say that. So you're very fortunate indeed, sir. Yes, had a lot of role models. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. Now, I mean, in particular, your, your book, uh, The Negro Leagues, Volume 2, that you, you wrote with Mr. Stivers, and we, uh, our prayers are out to him for his, his health that improves. Uh, we were hoping maybe we could get him on here with you, but uh, circumstances don't allow. I, what I'm really interested in is, you, I mean, you have pages upon pages of these uh, players that, uh, you know, just about anything you want to know about these guys, probably if I wanted to know each of their shoe sizes, you probably have it in there because <laughs> it is extremely thorough. Uh, but the what. Like I said, the one reason I got the book was for these uniform numbers and trying to identify, you know, what numbers each of these players wore, which, you know, like just like in, uh, you know, other leagues, they wore many numbers mm -hmm. as they went to different teams. But maybe you could explain sort of the process of how you went through that to, to find these, these uniform numbers, because believe me, I can I can attest to it. It's not very easy. Or a Darwin is a. Uh... There's a backstory to what motivated me to find the uniform numbers. I went to Cooperstown, the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, and I was talking with the head librarian, and we were discussing the most requested, you know, what is your most obvious question? You know, what is your biggest demand for information? He said, without a doubt, we get more calls about the Negro Leagues than anything. And I was surprised, and I said, well, outside of the Negro Leagues, what is your second most request? And she said, Jersey numbers. I'm like, Jersey's numbers? She said, yes, people want to know Jersey numbers because they order a Jersey for the 1954 New York Yankees and they want to put Mickey Mantle's number on that Jersey. So that's the request. What did Lou Gehrig, what number did Lou Gehrig wear of Babe Ruth? I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And so I said, I can do that. I got the information. I got the files. And it just seemed like all the energy just came together because fans were calling me about uh, many of the marketing apparels were producing Negro League jerseys at the time. And people wanted to put their uncle or their father's number on the back of that jersey. So where do you find that information? Well. That information is in the newspapers. Uh, before the season starts, they have a roster with lists with lists the players, uh, of course, name, uniform numbers, home or road, 
and maybe the size of their jersey and their pants. And so I started compiling that information. I also found uniform numbers on scorecards, found uniform numbers in files owned by certain teams. And what I did, I took all those numbers and, and names and I put them into an Excel spreadsheet. One entry at a time. Uh, this is the player's name, team, the year that he played, and the home and away jersey number. And this allowed me to sort uh, that database by player or by team or by uniform number. So if I wanted to, I could pick out the top players just by jersey number. You know, are there any Hall of Famers who wore number one? Uh, based on my research, that the highest number is number 66, worn by Dan Wilson for the 1942 New York Black Yankees. So I have a database that shows numbers from one through 66. But in my book with Wayne Stivers, we only listed the players by name uh, because we were running out of space. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You know, just the, the historic accuracy, uh, I'm assuming, because there's there's many times I was when I was reading through it, you would see like a particular player and you would see them, you know, 1934, 1935 and then 1937 wearing the same number. So, I mean, you did. I, I'm assuming you looked at it and said, OK, these are the three years we saw. We didn't see anything for 1936. We're not going to list them and we're not going to assume he wore that you know that same uniform number that season so that just those little details like that tell me that you were paying very close attention to what was being brought to you and make it very historically accurate yes that is correct uh, we didn't assume uh they wore the same jersey number the following year uh sometimes there were trades and sometimes they would wear hand-me-down jerseys from major league baseball one of the biggest challenges, as you know, in, in looking at jerseys is that the numbers are on the back of the uniform and you usually don't get a photograph of a ball player from the rear side. In some exceptions, I was able to look at photographs and I found numbers on their left sleeve or numbers on their left pants pocket. And so I got lucky there. Once again, just type it into the database and keep moving and keep going through all the score, score books and scorecards and newspapers that you can find where they list uniform numbers. Uh, what made it even more interesting, a year before Major League Baseball started, started to put numbers on the back of their jerseys, which was done by the Cleveland Indians in 1929 and a few days later by the New York Yankees, uh, the Chicago American Giants were the first professional team to put numbers on the back of their jerseys. So once again, the Negro Leagues are among those pioneers who started a revolution. So uh, that credit goes to, to the Chicago American Giants for putting their numbers on the back of their uniforms a year before the Cleveland Indians and the New York Yankees. Uh, by 1934, all the major league teams had uh, digits on the back of their uniform with the New York Giants being the last holdout. So it was a very interesting uh, journey and uh, it was a lot of fun doing it. Well, it certainly sounds like it's kind of ironic. The So the American Giants and the Negro Leagues were the first to put the numbers on and the, the New York Giants and the Major League, you know, Giants that being the, the common thread there were the last ones to put it on. So <laughs> kind of an ironic twist there, isn't it? So, yes. What were maybe some of the, the biggest surprises that you may have found in this journey going through the uniform numbers? Did you any, find anything, great stories or anything that sort of surprised you? I know you're a wealth of knowledge probably before you even started this endeavor in baseball history, but sometimes uh, you, you find things that uh, kind of shock you. Uh, not particularly. Uh, basically, the numbers were from one through 10. I think the teams are trying to keep it simple. But as players were traded and uh, uniforms were dissolved and they started to wear double digit numbers. So 
uh, basically the early days, most of the uniform numbers were single digit. Okay. Now, uh, did uh, how, how large were the, the normal rosters of the Negro Leagues? Well, we're looking at between 15 and 18 players versus 25 for Major League teams. Uh, the beauty, or I would say the beauty of a Negro League roster was most players could play multiple positions. So a pitcher may be put in right field if he was not starting that day. Uh, pitching staff is usually four or five players and with, with, with 12 team, with 12 member or 18 member team, roughly. It was uh, it was a challenge uh, to keep everybody healthy and, and just didn't have the uh, bandwidth economically to uh, have a 25 man squad like in Major League Baseball. So, so I take it there had to probably be some many times where your relief pitcher may be coming from another position on the, the field to, to pitch and your starting pitcher may be replacing him, probably some instances of that, I'm sure then. Yes, that is absolutely true, sir. Wow, that, that truly takes some talent to play at a, a high level like that. So quite a testament to, to these men. Now, I'm from uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, which is in the western side of Pennsylvania. And I, I know in recent decades, uh, we had a, a gentleman that's uh, probably very uh, familiar to you. Sam Jethro ended up uh, settling here after his uh, Negro League career and Major League career. And he actually is buried probably about uh, a mile from where I'm talking at right now. And so we, he, we got uh, quite a bit of press uh, in the last uh, few decades at uh, various times. And uh, you know, also, you know, a couple of teams that sort of jumped out at me were the, uh, you know, the, the Homestead Grays and the Pittsburgh Crawfords, which are both on the western side of Pennsylvania here. And I, I see that they were probably two of the more successful franchises uh, in Negro League Baseball. Uh, you know, I, I guess, is, was it more of a, a northeastern Midwest league or was it spread into the south at all? I mean, um. They had what they called the West League and the East League. The East League was mostly of teams along the eastern seaboard. Uh, very few Southern teams, although the Birmingham Black Barons and Jacksonville Red Caps and a few other teams had a presence in the Eastern Base Leagues. And let's remember before the Dodgers escaped Brooklyn and moved to L.A., we did not have any teams, say, west of the Mississippi. And so the, the Negro League teams were called Western teams that were stationed geographically in the Midwest, like Chicago American Giants, Detroit Stars, Kansas City Monarchs, St. Louis Stars, uh, the Cuban Giants, et cetera, et cetera. Th those were considered in the newspaper Western teams mm -hmm. located in the Midwest. So that's a confusion. Very few Southern teams uh, because of Jim Crow laws that existed during that period. But Birmingham had a large presence there at Rickwood Field. And every now and then, as we move into the late, late 40s, we may find a Negro League team in Houston or New Orleans. So those were the exceptions. But West versus East was the common theme in the newspapers back then. Uh, that that makes a lot of sense because I think uh, football, professional football, has a very similar path uh, until the Cleveland Rams moved to Los Angeles. There was nobody really west of the Mississippi, probably about that same era, and a lot of it probably had to do with uh, travel times. You know, most of the travel was by by train and, and bus in those eras, and they didn't have the uh, the uh, travel through the air that we we see today. That you know, we're more common uh, commonplace for us. So that's yeah, very very interesting. Yeah, and uh, by the way, Sam Jethro was one of my best interviews. I interviewed him several times. Number 27, great guy, very humble. And I think I think he's the oldest uh, rookie of the year in the American League. Really? Uh, he broke in wow. very late. I think he's probably 30 years old before he got the chance, somewhere around there. And he was rookie of the year. Just an incredible, incredible man. Very fast. They called him the Jet. <laughs> and he said, I never had any problems with my wheels. I was, I was like, <laughs> asking him about that. He said, no, I could, I could just flat out run. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I don't think, I, 
know of a bunch of different athletes that have the nickname jet. I don't know if any of them are going to be slow with having a nickname like that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's quite a testament to him. Yeah. He, I, he has an interesting story, how he got to Erie. Um, I was under the impression with giving him getting all the press here in Erie that he was born here, but he was born uh, in Missouri around St. Louis, I guess. And yes. he, he played for, at one time he played for Cle- the Cleveland Buckeyes, I believe as a team. Yes. And the, the owner of the Buckeyes, had some property, a hotel that was in Erie, the Pope Hotel. And during the off season, uh, Sam and his brother, whose name escapes me right at the moment, they they lived in the hotel and did some work or ran the hotel uh, for the the owner. And uh, he ended up, um, you know, meeting a young lady, I guess, and and settled here in Erie for the rest of his life. So, uh, very interesting story for him, indeed. Yeah, Pope was the owner of the Cleveland. Buckeyes, who won the uh, Negro League World Championship in 1945, uh, managed by Quincy Troop, who lived in St. Louis. And that's probably how Mr. Troop and Sam Jethro made that connection. Okay. Now, I was noticing, uh, you know, with the, the amount of team changes, was there more of a free agent uh presence in, in the Negro leagues than there were in the, the, the other leagues. Cause it seemed like there was a lot of uh, transfers and trades of, of players going through uh, to different teams. Uh, yes. Players jump uh, from team to team uh, based on their demand, uh, at particularly Satchel page. Uh, he might fly to New York and play one week with the New York black Yankees to uh, help a struggling franchise before he would return home to the Kansas City Monarchs or the Pittsburgh Crawfords. So players did jump. Uh, they normally signed one-year contracts, which were not – they didn't have an evergreen renewable option. And so they, they were free to go from team to team as they saw fit. And, of course, many of them worked in the offseason at a stockyard or worked a farm or had a barber shop or – did chores uh, during the uh, uh, winter months. Uh, they didn't. The salary in the Negro leagues just wasn't em- uh, enough money to be sustainable. Yeah. Okay. So, so a lot of times maybe they they played in the, the towns nearby where they worked in the off season. You're thinking, oh, definitely. Or? Yes. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm guessing that's probably how uh, the Pittsburgh area was able to support a couple different teams with Homestead and Pittsburgh Crawfords um, because of all the steel mills, I'm, I'm guessing probably. Oh yes, definitely. The Crawfords and the Grays, some of the players worked in the defense factories, uh, steel mills during that period. We got players out of Detroit who worked in the, worked on the assembly line for Ford uh, during that period. Uh, Kansas city. Some players worked at Sweet packing company. Uh, those were considered high paying jobs. And, and so you just, you found a way to, to cut out, cut your path financially uh, to be sustainable. Okay. That makes perfect sense. That, that, that makes me help understand the, the migration of the players going uh, to different teams. So very interesting. Uh, now, Larry, I just, you wrote uh, in your, in the book at the, uh, the, the back of this this book, the, the Negro Leagues book, uh, volume two, that you are the author of nine different books. So I'm assuming this is one of the nine. What, what are some of your other books about uh, in the, the Negro Leagues subject? Uh, I did a pictorial history on black baseball in Pittsburgh. It covers the Crawfords and the Grays. Pictorial history on Detroit. Uh, pictorial history on the Chicago American Giants, Chicago Union Giants, the Chicago Blank Giants, uh, many teams out of Chicago, including the Chicago Brown Bombers. Did a pictorial history on the Kansas City Monarchs. And the last one, pictorial history, was done on teams in New York, which would include New York Cubans, uh, New York Black Yankees, uh, New York Travelers, uh, the Lincoln Giants and the Lincoln Stars all the way back in 1915 during that period. Uh, also did a book uh, called Black Baseball's National Showcase. 
It's uh, about the East-West All-Star Game. Uh, probably my best work uh, from 1933 to about 1960. I give game-by-game -game accounts, uh, des descriptions. Uh, I use a lot of the actual verbiage from newspapers like the Chicago Defender, New York Amsterdam News, uh, Kansas City Call newspaper, Pittsburgh Tri Tribune. Uh, and basically I give game accounts, box scores, I even have voting results compiled by the newspapers to show how each ball player's popularity was rated. I do batting statistics and pitching statistics by team, by individual. And I have records that were set during the All-Star period uh, from 1933 to 1960. Then I have an all-time All-Star team where I take all the newspaper accounts uh, from various writers like Faye Young and John Johnson and Wendell Smith. When they name their All-Star teams at the end of the year, I list I list every one of those. That took up several pages. So uh, it's probably my most comprehensive work to date outside of the Negro Leagues book with Wayne Stivers. Uh, it was a fun book to, to do and I think I'm missing one more or one, one other. Oh, yeah, I did the uh, the first Colored World Series in 1924. Uh, that was probably my first book. It was called the Colored World Series because that was a term used during that period. I was not trying to make a political statement, but just to show how awesome this World Series was. It was, it was the best of nine back then, sir. Wow. The best of nine. Uh, one game was, uh, game four was a 13 to 13 tie. They had to call it because of darkness. They didn't have lights back then. But I think this is, without a doubt, the most dramatic World Series ever played because each team, the Kansas City Monarchs and the Hilldale Club out of, uh, out of Philly, each team ran off, reeled off three wins in a row. Four games were decided by a single run, and five games were won in the final inning. Uh, the Kansas City Monarchs prevailed five games to four over Hilldale Club, but they came back in 1925 and made a uh, got revenge and beat the Monarchs in six games. Uh, what I did with this is I did a play-by-play. -play. Despite what you may hear that uh, the hit, uh, African Americans are apathetic about their history and it was not recorded, simply not true. The play by play was printed in each newspaper. So I was actually able to recreate the game from the first pitch. I got the weather reports for each day from each city. I put that in the book so people would know what was the weather like during that day? You know, what was the wind velocity? Uh, what was the temperature, et cetera? And then I did a short bio on every ball player that participated on these two teams. And so I think it's ready for a movie right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so. It might be ready for broadcast, you know, for <laughs> like you're yeah. reliving the game. Wow. That, that sounds tremendous. Now, you know, are all these books available like on Amazon and some of the other uh, book outfits? Uh, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh, uh, they can either go to my website and, and find these books or go to Amazon. One book that didn't, do well is I wrote about Ruth Foster, the creator and founder of the Negro National League in 1920. I did a book about his journey and that was really tough because uh, Ruth died in 1930 and there was no one around that I could interview. So let's call Ruth Foster in his time. Uh, he was a visionary, a genius, and of course, he's in the National Baseball Hall of Fame as a owner and founder. And, and uh, I, I must add, he's, uh, you have a picture of Rube in your uh, Negro Leagues Volume 2, and I have to say, Rube Foster is a very dashing dresser, too. <laughs> you have a picture of him with a, a bowler hat and a nice suit on. It looks uh, very uh, you know, ready to, to go uh, to hit a night on a town or something. He's, he's very well dressed. So. Yeah, he's Great always picture. very dapper, and he, he always had an a very nice car, <laughs> <laughs> Apperson uh, Jackrabbit. I think that's what it was called. It was top of the line back then, but uh, 
Rube was an enigma. People either loved him or hated him. Very underrated uh, genius who, you know, in 1920, along with other owners, he was able to create the only all black league to survive a full season. So that he has to get credit for being a, a businessman. And people forget that during that period before the, before the league was created, he's one of the greatest pitchers in the league. He had a lot of tactics and he wrote a book about how to pitch. <laughs> and I found six no hitters that he threw. Wow. Uh, before 1920. The, the man was just awesome. Just, just an incredible man. I, I guess I'd be remiss. You mentioned your website. I want to make sure we get that out to the listeners. Uh, Larry Lester 42.com. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And I, I take it 42 is for uh, Mr. Robinson's uh, great number that uh, is so well honored. Yes. It's not my age. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know you're much younger than that. So. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to put a link in oh. the show notes here. When they go to Larry Lester 42.com, what kind of information can they uh, find there? Well, information besides my books, you'll find uh, information about uh, what I do for a living. Research is my passion. Uh, you'll find uh, information about my our grade marker project led by Dr. Jeremy Kroc out of Peoria, Illinois. Uh, we have a grade marker project where we raise monies to put a headstone on unmarked graves of Negro League veterans. Wow. Uh, you're also find a link to the Jerry Malloy Negro League Conference. Uh, this is the only academic symposium since 1998 that encouraged, encourages the study of Black baseball history. This year, we, we will be in Birmingham the first week of June. You'll find information about the Malloy Conference, and we offer four $1,000 scholarships, uh, two $500 library grants, uh, all this is a grassroots effort that we have where people just donate and this money goes right back out. There's no salaries paid and there's no products sold uh, via the Jerry Malloy Conference, which is under the umbrella of the Society for American Baseball Research, better known as SABRE. So you can find a, a lot of information about what I do, uh, what my passions are and and why I started the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in 1990, uh, which I'm no longer affiliated with, by the way, but I felt there was a need to uh, put all these boxes of notes and tidbits of information in this interview into a museum, uh, which happened. So I'm wow. thankful for that. Well, you, you have some, some great worthy causes. And uh, I mean, I, I applaud you for your preservation of, of history of sport and especially uh, the, these uh, ball players that didn't get the opportunity that uh, some of their white counterparts did, but uh, preserving their history and, and sharing this information with the public and truly a testament to you. And I, I have to ask you, do you ever get any sleep with all these things that you're, you're these reference books and all the uh, things that you're involved in? I, I mean, you, you must have very little time for anything else because you have do quite a bit of work here, sir. Well, I, I've heard that <laughs> comment before, and I really enjoy what I do. I, I, I put some late night hours in, and I've manned data from roughly 400 different newspapers. It took me years to go through microfilm copies. I didn't have the Internet when I started in 1970. And I would just go through reel by reel, page by page on a reel. And when I found a game or an editorial or something of interest, like a scorecard with numbers, I put my dime in the uh, microfilm machine and hit the record button, <laughs> print button. And it was like hitting a lottery to me. I'm like, oh, wow, I found another game. <laughs> and over the years, I have inputted every game. Uh, line by line into an access database that could spit out more than 200 different printed reports. Wow. And so I, I can tell you how many hits Willie the Devil Wells got on Sunday. <laughs> you know, I can filter it down and do any type of query that I want. I can let you know who, what third baseman hit the most home runs. Uh, what is Satchel Page's strikeout ratio per inning? What is Josh Gibson's home run rate? per at bat, 
uh, once all this stuff is into a database, you can just type all type of queries to produce different type of reports. Sometimes I do things like who has the highest complete game percentage. That tells me that the manager was confident that I'm going to stay with this ball player for, for all nine innings. And uh, Bullet Rogan, one of my favorite ball players, ranks very high in that category. He completed roughly 90, I think 92% of every game that he started. So hmm. uh, the, the database just reveals how, how great these ball players were. Uh, it just it, it, my, it boggles my mind that this information is available. It's all in the newspapers. It's all a matter of pulling it together, inputting it into some type of software that can spit out reports. And what you see today, all that information is now at seamheads.com, and uh, which is ran by Gary Ashwell. And he's still uh, massaging numbers, and we hopefully we will be finished <laughs> in a few months mm. to have all major league statistics from 1920 through 1948 available to everybody. That, then you can do your own filters and mm. customize reports. <laughs> I'm very familiar with Seams Head. It's, it's a great uh, website. It's a very, very great resource to look at uh, for for these athletes. So, excellent job, uh, sir. I my, again, my hats off to you. I thank you very much for for sharing your your story and the stories of these great athletes and these leagues that they played in and uh, your resourcefulness of uh, preserving the history of them. And uh, you know, thank you very much for for coming on and uh, sharing with us today. Well, thank you, Darn. I appreciate the time. Sorry, but my pitching coach just called timeout. He's coming out to the mound. I think I'm going to get yanked for a reliever. We'll see you back tomorrow for some more great sports history on Sports Jersey Dispatch Podcast. We invite you to check out our websites, jerseydispatch.com and pigskindispatch.com. Not only see the daily sports history, but to experience the preservation of great events and people that play the games. Find us on Pigskin Dispatch. It's also on social media outlets of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel. To get all your daily sports history. Pigskin Dispatch is happy to be associated with the Sports History Network, the sports headquarters of yesteryear, found at sportshistorynetwork.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.